Hello, I'm Matt Carpenter, and this is the Good Life Podcast. Hello, welcome to the Good Life Podcast. We are excited today to welcome back John Eric with us. Uh, we talked to John a little while back, and he is still uh, a logger working in the Washington, D.C. area. And he is an author for several publications, uh, and he specializes in history, political theology, political theory, and uh, quite a few other things. If you get a chance to read him at at Fontes, or uh, I I know there's multiple other places, we'll link to those. But thanks, John, uh, for coming on with us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me back. Had a great time, and uh, yeah, really glad to be here. So the last, well... I won't talk about the, the last time, but we, you know, we, we discussed some of, of what you had written last time. But the particular article I want to focus on today is your work uh, called Christendom After Comcast. And you take an interesting track in this because you talk about how conservatives always like pointing back at a time when things were going well. They say, from X point, because of this, whatever this is, things started to go downhill. And, And then, you know, sometimes they'll give an overview of what all the different potential points are. And of course, with their great enlightening understand, enlightened understanding, they say, but actually, it was this point at which it went down, and and you talk about some of those, but you act you don't point to a particular time in history where things were going well, and then it takes off. Although you may have an opinion on that, but you talk about the solution. So, what is often the solution that is presented to the the problems that we see right now? So. At- I think no matter where you decide to situate your account of where things started going bad, if you're if you're Catholic, you say it was Martin Luther. If you're you're Protestant, you might say it was when we took the Bible out of public schools. If you're a uh, follower of the radical orthodoxy school, you might think it's when John Dunn Scotus uh, started talking about the university of being. You can basically have all sorts of decline narratives that, as you mentioned, you can just situate it at different points. And the underlying assumption here is that if you simply have a better argument, a better idea, you can ultimately just overcome that idea. And you can you can go back to the past once you've corrected this error and just kind of continue on your course. Um, because the, the fundamental account of history is progress on this view is that it's about ideas versus other ideas. And some ideas just happen to take off and they were never rebutted sufficiently. So if you could argue people back into sense, then you'd be able to return to a prior golden age. And I understand the temptation to do that because, as Richard Weaver reminds us, ideas clearly do have consequences. If we look at the history of Western civilization, you see this happening all around. You see a huge uh, huge currents of thought that emerge from people like Luther, who's introduced new ideas, talking about papal authority, talking about the importance of scripture. You see huge downstream ramifications of this. But I think what that argument tends to leave out is simply the fact that these ideas can only spread under particular types of material conditions. And so if we look back at the Reformation period, because that that's the type of period that Christians like to argue about, because it's when an authentically Christian society, as people see it, started to fall apart. Um, when you have this Reformation scenario or pre a, a, a medieval polity, an environment where individuals basically spend their entire lives living in particular local communities, then that's not a type of environment where you're going to have a lot of cross-pollination and exchange of different ideas going back and forth. If you're born into a particular place, a particular role, a particular social station, your knowledge of what the faith is comes from your local parish. And maybe you'll have some exposure to the bishop when he comes through, but your experience of your world and your faith is profoundly localized in a way that I think it's hard for us to even conceptualize today. Whereas you can get in your car now and go across multiple state lines within just a couple hours, depending on where you live. You can open up your smartphone. You can see ideas from all over the world, from tons of different religious traditions that are well outside Christianity altogether, different perspectives within Christianity. 
our exposure to different competing ideas now is so radically different than it was ever in prior times, uh, simply because we've invented new technologies of communication that allow this to happen. And this begins in the Reformation with the printing press. The Reformation takes off because these ideas can spread in a culture where more people are literate and where you have an ability to widely disseminate these ideas in print through the larger reading public. If you don't have the printing press, then the Reformation simply doesn't take off in the way that it does. So simply talking about ideas versus other ideas and thinking that, you know, if we beat this particular idea back, then we could have a different kind of history than we have today. This ignores the fact that the reason that ideas have consequences in many ways is because they're spread within a context of technology and uh, of different material conditions that really do profoundly affect the ability of those ideas to reach a large public. So then, that's a mouthful. <laughs> That's a lot to unpack. Then let, let, let's start early, you know, a, a little bit uh, further back from in what you said. The the general drive. Let's just talk about the general drive towards the past. There are, and I know you have a separate article on this elsewhere about the desire to return, and we talked about some of this. Uh, previously, but what is the, I mean, this combination, what is the drive, what is it that, that moves us to, to think that the past is a place for us to, not just to receive ideas, but for, for some, it's a whole, it's a desire to just wholesale return to that. If we can, if we can go back to this way of life, you know, keeping indoor plumbing and dentistry as it is, if we could just, you know, have this, is that type, I mean, where does that come from? What, 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 is, what is the motivation to want to, you know, go back to life before Luther, before the Reformation, or before SCOTUS, or fill in the blank? That's a great question. And I think I think it comes from the fact that our modern culture that we experience today seems so far from God in the deepest sense. It seems like we have that we we don't take religion seriously in our politics. We don't take religion seriously in our culture. We have active attacks on that in our uh, culture in many ways and efforts to really push forward a, a different vision of the human person that's not consonant with the Christian tradition. When all these things seem like they're happening at once and when we have internet and communications technology that puts this in front of us all the time, then we start to ask what kinds of other modernities are possible? What kinds of other ways of life could we have? And when you start to look back on that and you start to consider what it would look like to have a Christian society that doesn't have all these pathologies of the modern world that we see around us, you want to find examples in the past of Christian societies that worked in some way or another. And that could whether that could be uh, you know the, the early Middle Ages where everybody was under one Catholic Church. You could look at Puritan New England where everybody basically shares the same Presbyterian social commitments. Um, you can look back at these different examples of Christian societies and think, okay, let's put our finger down there. Let's say that this is the this is a proof of concept for something that works. And if we want to th start thinking about how to get out of our modern predicament, well, we need to figure out what ideas underpin this particular kind of Christian society, and then we need to mainstream those ideas. That's what it means to effectively go back. And I think there's there's real power in that. There's, there's a real appeal to that, because it seems like our forefathers built great things and did great works. And so we want to have, if, if we're going to be Christians who believe that you know Christ is Lord over all things, we want to be people who work in our political context as well, to bring that about. And it, then, uh, of course, the devil is in the details about how you get to that point. So, there is, I mean, there, there's a significant irony here that we, most people, receive their view of the past not from the schools they attended when they were young or even from the college they attended and their professors. Most people get their ideas from the past, and I'm talking about the majority, from YouTube and articles that they read on the internet. And, and 
<laughs> so, so we want to go back to a past that in some cases would limit our ability to do the very thing we're doing right now and I don't mean getting rid of all technology but but it, it, even if it's just having a more uh, singular source of authority we come to that opinion by millions of sources of authority exactly and yeah the the fact that you can go online and see these images of a, a past which in in some ways half of this stuff is ai generated right. uh, eric hobsbawm coined the great phrase invented tradition and in some sense that's what you see here you see people you know going to ai tools or you know youtube or netflix or other places to get ideas of an imagined past and the fact that you have access to those resources from which you can build your idea of how great the past would be, you couldn't have done that in Reformation uh, Germany. You couldn't have done that in early America. And so it's just a very different epistemic environment than anything in the actual Christian societies that people think they want to be going back to. As, exactly. It, there's an incredible irony here. Um, and that that I think is the that's the predicament of modernity in some ways is that we find ourselves trying to recapture a past but our our only conception of that past and the way in which we're trying to grasp it has to be done through the very instrumentalities that make that past irretrievable and if my guess and and and, and I will admit to, to a to a view that there's a lot of things as they progress in history that are not getting better so, I mean, I'm saying that up front, but if you were to offer uh, the average medieval person, or, you know, or, or even Reformation, Renaissance era, the opportunity to experience, j just to live for a short time in what we have, my guess is quite a few of them probably would. I mean, the, the, it, it would, I mean, if it didn't blow their minds, uh, they would jump at that because they they were so limited in their choices and they didn't know they were limited in their choices it's like i used to tell my students if you never knew that snickers bars existed you would never want one <laughs> exactly yes i completely agree uh a thing i i think about often with this and i i have a three-year-old and a one-year-old um infant mortality rates compared to what they are what they are now versus what they were in medieval period or even comparatively recently the fact that you know when you when you have a child you have reasonable confidence now that your children are going to live to adulthood and that's unbelievable i, I can't imagine what it would have been like to live in a world where i there's 50 percent odds that my one-year-old is never going to see his 10th birthday yes. and that if if we acknowledge that you know human beings are created to love their families and love life. That's part of God's good order. Then a world in which where you don't have such casual loss of human life, just as a tragic necessity of you're right. Of course, people are going to prefer that. And I, I think in the, when, you know, when we talk about modernity in the negative sense, and as I think we agree, there, there's a lot of problems with our, our current order. I think it's, it's easy to think that the people in the past who pursued these ideas and these projects made some kind of Faustian bargain and sold away their world of enchantment and their, their authentic Christian society for a bunch of cheap capitalist consumer goods or bad ideas or whatnot. But the reason that people made the choices they did is because, you know, there, there were radical changes in technology that made people's lives better in meaningful ways and that made them in meaningful ways that we can't imagine what it would be like to live without them. We take for granted the good while we highlight the bad and i think that that's the that's the predicament that we face when we, we have these kinds of conversations is we we obviously can see the problems that we have in our culture today but it, it becomes harder to see how much else we take for granted in that process right yeah. and while i don't buy certainly the say brad gregory argument that the reformation is what gave us secularism as it stands right now. Uh, no one can deny the correlation that exists. And I think from, from your article, it's safe to say, and correct me if I'm wrong, 
that the things that gave rise to the Reformation, the factors, mass communication on a scale up to that point totally unforeseen, you know, unforeseen by previous generations, those factors were not going to stop with the Reformation. They were. They would continue, and the, while not the Reformation itself, but that communication and the ability to to spread ideas was going to lead to some form of individualism, unless something significant were to stop it. Exactly. Um, Kevin Vallier, who's a philosopher, has a great book out where um, he considers what it would take to get to something like the conditions of Catholic integralism. And this was this it's a few years old, but this was a this was a, a kind of an online movement to say, you know, basically we could solve all of America's problems if Rome would just uh, America would just submit itself to the, the Roman pontiff. If we could just become a fully Catholic society like we had in the Middle Ages. And it sounds crazy when you frame it that way. There were people that are, made this argument pretty seriously and thought about what it would take to actually make that happen. And the thing that Vallier brings up in his book is what you have to do to make this happen is you have to have recognition of the papacy as a meaningful theological authority in the lives of ordinary people. And, you know, if you look at the data, like 95% of American Catholics use birth control. So the, the authority of the papacy is clearly not what it used to be. They're, we're not going to have anybody prostrating themselves in the snow at Canossa to Pope Francis anytime soon. That's just not how modern sovereignty works. And so, yeah, the conditions for what it means to have theological authority in this sense they're just gone. We have a, a diffuse, fractured world when it comes to who has authority in the theological context. And that that would happen if you have a, a Catholic society, that would happen if you have a Protestant society. We have technology now that has just undone the kinds of authority frameworks that once were just taken for granted. You, you don't ha If you don't like what your bishop is saying or you don't like what your pastor is saying, you can always find somebody else online that will tell you what you want to hear. Right. Right. I've heard of people that do that. Uh, I, 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 you know, heard stories of that happening. Uh, so, at one place in your article, you say, and this this is a wonderful term, and I know it's not original with you, but that that individuals in the West are quote theologically cross pressured. Talk about that. What does it mean that we are theologically cross pressured? So this is a term that comes from Charles Taylor in his book, A Secular Age. And the, the thing that he stresses is that if when you, when before the modern world comes into being, because you live in a village in a particular place with a particular religious identity, for you, all that you know is your Christian identity and your identity as somebody that is in a world structured by Christian categories. The question of does God exist, uh, does, is God personal, did Jesus die on the cross? These questions simply don't arise for you in that context in the same way, because it is all you've ever heard. Maybe maybe there are one or two people who are skeptical for whatever reason, but by and large, the conventional wisdom in society is that these things are true. People are born and die and have kids, and they're all brought up in the same way of thinking, such that questions really just don't emerge in that context. And what we have, this is so alien to us to even think about because we live in a context where there are people who simply don't think like we do and we encounter them every day. I'll never forget, I was probably about six years old and I, I had to do something at Southern Methodist University uh, down on the campus in, in Dallas. And I saw a sign on a bulletin board. It was an adver advertisement for a lecture, uh, Why Islam? And it was an invitation from like the Muslim student group to come and hear about Islam and uh, why you should, you should be a Muslim. And I had been raised in a Christian household. I'd gone to Christian school and churches, and I knew abstractly that Muslims existed, but I had never seen an assertion of an Islamic truth claim in the public sphere before that point because of the world in which I'd lived. The fact that I can think, oh, there are people that believe that Islam is correct and Christianity is not, and that that kind of enters our consciousness in a very deep way, that we live in this kind of environment, that's what it means to be theologically cross-pressured in Taylor's sense, that we have senses of other options for what it could be like to live a good life. We, we might not have any religion at all. We might know somebody that watches football on Sundays and doesn't go to church at all. Um, we can think of these as potential life paths for ourselves 
in ways that simply aren't accessible when everybody goes to church. There's a strong social norm that everybody be there, everybody do what the bishop says, everybody follow the dictates of the church. Um, we just simply aren't in that space anymore. We have too many different options for how to live, how to understand our relationship to God. And now we have uh, every opinion of a, you know all, that you can imagine from saying the, uh, Paul Pot was actually a good guy, just mostly misunderstood, to uh, this is eight reasons why my essential oils will heal your marriage and, and everything, you know, all, and all with reasons stated afterwards. So there, there, there is a lot of pressure. And I think, and, and because we, we are a more educated society in general, we emphasize education, people feel the need, not just their natural interest in, or, you know, Augustine talks about the, the, the problems that come with curiosity, but but we have a desire to grow, and we feel like we must be well read on things. So I, I can I show that I'm educated by knowing this obscure person who wrote 200 years ago, who had a bizarre idea that nobody's ever heard of, but I have, and so with with those with all of those things coming at us it's not only for some people a, a drive to write or to podcast but it's also a, for many it's a drive to, to consume we think I'll, I'll be it's fear of missing out if, if I don't consume if I don't keep up with what others are seeing that I will be the, the proverbial ostrich with his head in the sand so th there's this there's a drive to for some to present information and for others to to know and to be in the know on whatever the interesting topics of my social group are. Exactly. Um, when I when I first heard what you mentioned, this Augustine and Curiositas, and this is something I I struggled with conceptually for a long time, and then it finally clicked for me during the pandemic when I realized doom scrolling or just going through Twitter and looking at everything that's bad that's happening in the world just because you feel like you ought to in order to scratch some itch within yourself that lets you think that you're informed, that you're knowledgeable, that you're in mass you have mastery over what's going on simply because of what you're exposing yourself to, that's curiositas. Doom scrolling is curiositas. And that's the I think that's the, it's just a temptation that we have when we have this flood of cross pressuring information coming in on all sides. There's the famous, I think it's Thoreau quote, and I'm not fond of quoting Thoreau very much, but when, when the telegraph was invented, and he talked, and I, I can't give a quote, this is just off the top of my head, but, and of course I learned it, thankfully not from the internet, but I actually, I remember reading it <laughs> in a book, but he said that now we have the ability to know when so someone in royalty has a particular sickness. But is there a reason why we should know that, that someone in royalty has that sickness? I mean, it, it, he, he's asking a legitimate question there, and I mean, I, which I think gets to the point we're making. So then what happens with, I mean, cause we're, we're, we're talking, we've talked about various types of authority in politics and and certain you know this happens with the home but then when, theologically you you written uh, I, I saw because you're you're in the LCMS uh, and so so you or you've written about about things going on there and and so we are uh, reformed what happens with theological authority in our age, I mean, what 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 is this this the availability of information? What does that do with the number of podcasts, YouTubers, and and the like? How does that affect theological authority? Yeah, I think the the biggest effect of this is that your the ordinary authorities that God puts over us, our embodied 
pastors and priests and elders, the authority of those elders comes to be quest felt as questionable in view of the presence of alternative sources of theological authority that are out there on the internet for your consumption. So if your pastor says, you know, I think that some kids in the congregation like you, you know, you should be following, uh, living a quiet life in all godliness and holiness, and you should be putting your head down and trying to work in school, be good at school, try to live out your vocations and love God and love your neighbor. And maybe you should not be like rad radically agitating for revolution online. If, if your pastor is saying that in the real world, then you go online and there are people who are saying things like, you know, your pastor is just a, a slave of the modern world who just in internalized modern assumptions. You know, if you go back and look at the things the reformed scholastics or the Lutheran scholastics wrote about political theory, you'd see that everything your pastor's saying is bunkum and that you actually really need to be preparing for big time political collapse. What you have here is an internal conflict between what your pastor is saying your life course should be and what people on the internet are saying your life course should be. And both of these people claim to stand within the same theological stream. For any denomination, you can find people who say they're part of the LCMS or part of the PCA or part of the OPC who are saying they speak from within that tradition. And they're trying to give scripts for behavior to ordinary people in the pews. And those scripts for behavior for ordinary people oftentimes contradict what individual pastors or churchmen might be saying in the context of the local congregation, which is where Christian life has been traditionally lived out. And this creates a situation of cross-pressuring on the individual level, like who are you going to listen to? Who, who has authority in that situation? The person who speaks as a disembodied authority or the person who speaks as an embodied authority? This reminds me of the debates that went on during the first Great Awakening when you had some, uh, you know, the, 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 the new lights who that they were you know really they have a particular view on on what the church should do and and, and I'm, I'm, I'm starting to collapse and things so I need to be careful here because that came a little bit later but, but but you had the people supporting the first great awakening who ha did not have much of a problem undercutting the local church they were, while technically a part of a church or a part of a denom well, you know, denomination, they would critique the ministers who did not support what they were doing, who did not support their project. I even for some, saying there's a you know they're unregenerate because they are not actually following us. And then of course the the other side was saying no, there's actually some significant problems here with the way that they are you know the, the, a lot of great awakening pastors are conducting themselves. And so you have an American version of a, of a debate that's gone on for a while, but but it's the same debate except the number of characters now uh, are exponentially multiplied. Yeah, right. Right. Are you starting to say something? Oh no, I just I, I agree with you completely. It's a uh, it's I, Tocqueville would probably say something about it being the American spirit. Yes, yes, and you know there that is there, and probably if I had to guess, I think you, you could. It, it's always fascinated me how the Reformation took off in the more Augustinian portions of Europe and in the northern parts of Europe. And again, that, that's somewhat general, but you have, you know, where, where Luther is in Germany, and then you do have Switzerland with, with Geneva, but then it, I mean, there, there will be generally further north will be more Protestant. And of course, the the England will <clears throat> will settle on being Protestant, and then of course America takes Protestantism to its, you know, <laughs> we we make Protestantism great, we think for the first time. <laughs> <And> <laughs> so anyway, 
But then Southern Europe stays largely Roman Catholic. And, and it's interested me just that, that kind of Anglo... Uh, and by Anglo-Saxon, I'm not just talking about the British Isles. I'm talking about the Northern Germanic peoples who will move. They're the ones who will carry this kind of argumentative, no, we're going to have this out. Whereas in places like Spain and Italy, I know there were re- little c, excuse me, little r reformers, but the Reformation will by and large not catch on very well in those places. And I, I just wonder to what degree it is the, the kind of the makeup of the culture in that place if those who are more given to uh, to being rock rib sturdy slash stubborn and willing to to argue it, I mean, they did a, there's a lot of pushing and so as they migrate and again I know I'm presenting in very broad terms here but it's, it seems like there is something to that because America was settled not by southern Europeans uh, we were settled by northern Europeans, mostly uh, the the Anglo's. So, I mean, it, it, again, I don't know. You don't have to say anything about that other than, huh? But <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's just an interesting thing to, to me to, to to talk because we're talking about arguing and stuff online, and and I have I have no idea what this looks like in other contexts, but. My guess is that when it comes to being spitfires, uh, America does, you know, w- w- we try to make sure, we-, we teach the world what arguing online should look like. <laughs> no, you're right. And I, uh, that's a fantastic point that you make. I I'd never really thought about it in those terms before. But yeah, now that I think about it, I think you can make a pretty good argument that one of the reasons the the Protestant ethos takes off in some of these places is because the the northern european contexts are places where you know if you if you look at the environmental conditions you have to be a risk taker to survive in places like scandinavia and england and the alps and places like this and you that that's inherently going to foster more individualism and more combative approach to things and then the people that are willing to pack up pack up everything and cross the atlantic ocean and settle in a hostile land potentially um yeah you're gonna be uh you can have something like Machen's warrior children uh, in the in the cultural sense, right? I mean, it, it was it was bound to happen. I even I, I remember seeing a map of Germany and the different principalities that remained Catholic and those that went Protestant, and it was a pretty clear northern southern divide. Yep, there. And so, anyway, that 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 should. I think that that plays into what has you know what has made us who we are right now. Now, right. You, you talk about also in the article uh, Tish Harrison Warren, and, and I remember when when her article in 2017 came out, where she, where she talks about the problems of authority in an age of rampant podcasts everywhere so I mean is she making generally the same points that we've made so far you know in, in, in the conversation today is there anything that, that really sticks out I know that's been a while since you you know since you wrote this and then certainly since she wrote that article is there anything that jumps out to you though that you remember about her you know her, her article and what she was saying yeah, I, th- I think this is this is very much the same sort of argument. I I think what I what I was trying to do in my piece is kind of contextualize this in a a lar- larger set of questions about why people what why people want to return to the past and what makes that impossible. But she places I think she puts her finger right on the problem of the as a descriptive phenomenon, you know, the contested authority in the Christian blogosphere. And what was interesting to my mind is that she was writing that in a context where. One of the biggest issues was she, she was writing all, all not not quite but in many ways uh, as a woman to other women in the context of women's ministries online and i think in the years since that article came out this particular authority contestation question um it's really taken on a different flavor among christian men 
in that it the questions now are you know is my pastor based enough in light of current cultural conditions depending on what i'm reading online about what it really means to be a, a christian man standing up against a, a corrupt culture is my is my denomination too weak do we need to be we more solid or we've been colonized by the post-war consensus so I think she really nailed a phenomenon that, if, if anything, began in one part of the blogosphere and it's kind of just spread on Twitter and in other places since then. There was a, there was a book group that I'm a part of this summer, and we are reading John Plow, see, uh, Charles Spurgeon's John Plowman's talks. And one of the chapters in there is on religious grumblers. And he talks about people who complain that the pastor is this or that or that the church has this problem or that problem and you know it's so some things don't don't change except today those people have well not many people blog anymore but but you know they probably have two anonymous substacks <laughs> yeah. and you know called you know, I don't know Charlemagne return or something like that who, who's and they also have a YouTube channel it's, it's funny that the people who decry weak local churches tell people that they should change churches so you're saying if you do and I'm not saying that it's wrong for somebody to leave their church I mean there, there's each person has to answer that themselves which is a very Protestant thing to say uh, certainly but there is again that is just something that has remained with us since I mean, I mean that that's just that's part of who we are so and then what I hear you say is, is that many claim they love authority as long as they get to choose who that authority is bingo bingo and when you leave your church to go to another church because you think it's it's more based or more in line with your particular political convictions, you, by that act in many ways, show that you are not the sort of person who would do well under the kind of authority structures that you think you want. And so in the, the praxis of doing this, of trading one authority for another, is incompatible with living respectfully and coherently under theological authority in the sense of returning to some bigger tradition that you want. You make yourself the Roger Williams or the Anne Hutchinson who then leaves the colony. Right. So we're not going to go back to the village. You know, M. Night Shyamalan's, you know, the village mentality. Although some aspire to that. Uh, again, that's something that <laughs> it's a very modern thing uh, or postmodern thing that, that you, you, you can, you know, if you want to cho choose to live in a small community on your own, then you can. But what should churches do to combat sure. this? I mean, how, how do we end by I mean, what are we called to do in an age when this is upon us? And we're not putting the lid back on. We're not going back. I mean, how, how do we proceed? So what I, I suggest in the article, and this is, this is not a let's transform all of culture with one blow kind of step. Um, my, my thoughts with this proposal, it, it is more along the lines of how do we become the type of people who are... Christians capable of recognizing authority put over us by God in, a, in an embodied sense. But I think it's what people want. People want to have that kind of recognition and people want to be that kind of Christian, whether they might, they might contest it online, they might not always act consistently with that. But extending the benefit of the doubt, I think Christians of good faith want to be that sort of person, somebody who would do well in a society that was integrally Christian, that had a, a common Christian self-consciousness where um, people could live their entire lives in a, a Christian milieu. How do you become a person who would flourish under those conditions? I think one first step would be that people, individuals should provide and churches should collect the social media handles of your parishioners. 
pastors should know who their congregants are online. And I'm, I'm not even going to go so far as to say nobody should be able to have anonymous accounts, because if you if you work at a Fortune 500 company or some other place where being identified as a Christian who has socially conservative views would really be a professional liability, and you want to communicate with people online or in a public context, sure, maybe you can use an anonymous account for that. I personally, I have not done that. I don't think that's necessarily a great habit for a variety of reasons, but I, I don't even think you need to say that Christians shouldn't be doing this. But to the extent that you have these accounts, I think your pastor should know who you are online. And here's a, I, I, I get a concrete example of this. So maybe this might've been close to a decade ago. I, I posted a stack of books that I had recently bought from a, a theological bookseller. And one of them was a book, uh, by proponents of something called the new Finnish interpretation of Luther, which is kind of a, a novel reading of what Martin Luther said about uh, the nature of justification and its relationship to ontology. And my pastor replied to my tweet and said, you know, there are some thoughts in that. There's some good stuff in that book, but there's some potential theological concerns. Once you've read it, let's talk. That's great in my mind. That's totally appropriate. I, I would never feel like that is an overstep by my pastor to say something like that. When I have said publicly online that I'm reading these things, my pastor knows who I am and a pastor is willing to engage with me theologically if he thinks, you know, this is a potentially dangerous thing or this is a heterodox resource. And being willing to be somebody who is open to their pastor in that context and willing to be not even corrected, but at least acknowledged as an actor online, I think that's a really important step in becoming the kinds of Christians who can live under embodied theological authority, who, can, who would be worthy of being in a Christian society. And if there's a big gap between who you are online and who you are in your parish, I think it's a problem. I think that that's a inauthentic way to live as a Christian. And I think the if your pastor would be horrified by the things that you're posting and arguing about online, then that's something that you should ultimately have to ask yourself, are you are you living in a way that is consistent with your own professed convictions? Are you living in such a way that you would be a good member of the kind of society that you claim to be working for online? And I, I realize that's probably makes people uncomfortable. And the thought that your pastor might be watching what you're doing on the internet publicly. But a couple of things on that. First of all, if you're worried about that, then I think you should ask yourself why. Why is that something that would turn you off or bother you? If you are so confident that you are asserting things that are what Christians have believed always and everywhere, then this should not be a, a significant step to take. And then secondarily, I think if you are someone who's on the internet, not just consuming information, but creating information, speaking as a representative of a particular Christian tradition, then yes, the, the church as it is of real people has a responsibility to engage with what you are saying in the name of the church. If you are spreading false teaching in the name of the church, then the church has a duty to correct that. And so I think that that might not be a big cultural transformation thing that could overthrow modernity and put us back on the path of having a Christian society. Um, but I think it as a formative step that can make us better people and better Christians more capable of living in the kind of society that people claim to want, this is a first step towards that. It is, on one hand, for, for some people, it's a letdown when they think, I mean, it, people who believe, many of whom who believe in decentralization, which again is a significantly, is something that really caught, caught on in America and in Britain. I mean, the, the, there, there's been a lot of emphasis on that, and I know there is in other parts as well, but we love talking about decentralization. But then when you present decentralized local, you know, what what local churches can do, it's kind of disappointing to people because they, they people say they like decentralization when some actually want Caesar, a, a Christian Caesar with the powers of a totalitarian right. to right. force. If, if not force conversions to force Christian society onto people and, 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 and people think, whether it's Christian nationalism, which is, you know, the big Protestant thing. I don't know if Lutherans have, you know, bring Wittenberg to America movements or anything like that. I have no idea. But so I know some of your... Go ahead. 
Uh, that's the that's the advantage of being outsiders to the American experiment. So most of us came in in immigration waves from the 1800s on. So uh, I don't think that, there's nobody who's theorizing an American Lutheran Christendom because I think we're we're at least self aware enough to realize that if this is if this country is going to be any flavor of Christian nationalism, it's going to be Presbyterian. Well, uh, I, I, again, a, a significantly decentralized church. I mean, what Presbyterianism is and so <laughs> you don't get the top down I mean th there's not the Presbyterian Caesar it, it just doesn't I mean maybe right. the closest thing we I, I heard and I don't know if you ever um, listened to you know the, the, the guys kind of in that that unique um, or large -o orthodox uh, but also uh, there's a few Protestants in the circle like kind of like Jonathan Pajot and, 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 and some of those guys. But, but, but there's one, um, one guy, a Christian Reformed pastor named Paul Vanderclay, who I listened to because he's just got some interesting takes. Uh, but he, he said at one, one time that the closest thing we've ever had to a truly... Uh, Protestant Christian nationalism in the United States is when the main lines, mainline churches were at their height in the 30s and the 40s. I mean that. I mean, and, and you can argue. I mean, Puritan New England and stuff. I mean, but but as far as over the entire country, what we know as the United States today, that is the closest we've come. When you have Roosevelt and um, Churchill on the naval ship and they are leading the sailors in singing a hymn before, I mean just all of this stuff that, that, that we I, I could not imagine Joe Biden leading anybody in anything at what when it comes to like a, 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 a clearly Protestant hymn not just because he's Roman Catholic I mean that I, I couldn't that, that and that's not a slam on our president that's just saying that's not something we do right and but, but it's intriguing that, that again even if we look at 1940s America or let's even take the 50s after the war is over and you know Eisenhower's president and you know so that that's when for, for some people that's when they say this is this is when life was its best mm -hmm. and, and we did church attendance was at its highest point percentage wise that we've had in I don't know how long perhaps our entire history but yet there's a lot of people today who say, who, who complain about all the liberalism in the church when that was when the American church, certainly in the 20th century, was at its highest point and had the greatest cultural authority that we've seen in a long time. Right, yeah, totally agree. Um... Yeah, I think the, the the idea that you could have a Christian Caesar who would radically transform the country and put it back on like a, you know, orthodox reform or a small o orthodox reformed footing. The only the way in which you have to get to that point is to, to have massive popular support for some sort of project like that. That kind of support simply does not exist. And so you're you're forced into one of two scenarios. Either the country undergoes like some radical seismic collapse, like in Cormac McCarthy's The Road, and we, we reconstitute some sort of society along neo-Puritan lines, and we can just like start from scratch. Uh, or alternatively, you know, you get a few people who are in, in have the, the levers of power and maybe the ear of the military and you just kind of force things top down. The, the latter course seems wildly implausible to me, and that I, I don't think there's a mechanism in our federal system for that kind of power administration. The U.S. is too big and too decentralized for that. And secondarily, the uh, even if you have an apocalypse scenario, you're going to have the, the rubble and detritus of a previous society lying around in a way that leaves people who can are still literate cross-pressured in exactly the same way. They're, they're living in a ruined environment that's full of challenges to whatever established society that you, you then re try to reconstitute. So unless you have massive information control, like in you know, Lois Lowry's The Giver or The Hunger Games or something like that, which is, these, these are not stories that I think we should be emulating as examples of uh, right. model right. Christian governance. 
I, I, I think the what, what people are frustrated by is the fact that we don't have ma mainstream support for anything like what you just mentioned, the, the big pan-Protestant consensus of you know, the 1940s and 1950s. People just aren't there for this anymore. And so I see a lot of this uh, the kind of the talk about Christian nationalism and reactions and it's stuff in this vein. This is frustration that we live in an environment where people don't think this anymore. People are not Christian in the sense that we would like them to be. They're not as patriotic as we'd like them to be. We have lots of information, communications flying around that leave us in a contested condition and pull kids away from the, the fades of their families. I think and I totally understand those frustrations. I, I would love it if more people in this country were Christian and we could have laws and policies that more authentically reflect God's created order. I would love that. That's simply not the world in which we're living. And I think the, the to the extent that Christian in, in, laymen and Christian ministers have a responsibility to navigate that environment, that needs to take the form of not not just kind of retreating into a let's let's design the political theory for what will come after the apocalypse. But let's ultimately figure out how to live under the conditions in which we find ourselves and do so as Christians. And that means being willing to submit ourselves to the authorities that we do, in fact, have in our own worlds because God's put them there. That sounds remarkably like what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 12 and 13. You know, what we're, he, he gives his disquisition, uh, brief though it is, on government. I mean, he, he says in 12, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So you don't extract vengeance. But then he, he doesn't say that no one is to extract vengeance because he says in 13, that's what we have magistrates for. And I mean, I, I, I've told people before, they should be a lot more concerned about who their local sheriff is than even who the president of the United States is. Right. I'm not saying you shouldn't care about the president, but you'd you know, what election is going to get the most attention in 2024? It's right. not the thousands of sheriffs who are running for office. It's and, and and I get it, but but that is a. Uh, I believe it, it, it is focusing on the wrong thing, on the thing that we really because whoever gets elected as president, we can't do a whole lot. I mean, we're I cannot change who is involved in the administrative state and all the things that they do very well from where I am. But I can talk to my local sheriff's deputies and right. my city councilmen. Right. And, you know, you make a really, really good point because the, the, the fascinating thing about this is I think if you asked the president or many of the people who are elected leaders what they can do about things, they would say they can't do that much either. And yes. The, the reason for that, there's just there's so many levels of like interposing sovereignty in this country. We don't have a totalitarian mechanism that allows for the, the projection of power in a really dramatic way that can meet, effectively get things done. That's just not how the American system has been designed. And, you know, we, we, people can ask good questions about whether or not it was great to build a system that gridlocks so easily or that makes it so hard for anything to get done. But you're absolutely right. That in terms of what actually affects your life, your local leadership is going to affect your life a lot more than what happens in Washington, D.C. Because you, you might not be able to do a lot about what the president is doing. The president can't do that much about what you're doing. So, Right. I mean, I, it, it's, it's interesting. I've heard Miles Smith at Hillsdale talk about this idea before. He said that, that Americans, we view our president more like a monarch than England views its actual monarch. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. What we, I mean, all the pageantry that we've developed, that we, you know, and, and I'm not saying we shouldn't honor our authorities. I'm, I'm, that, it's not, and he's not complaining, I, except to say that we we have this. I mean, that 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 comes into your mind where you think, well, of course, if he wants something done, he just has to sign an executive order and do it. And it doesn't work precisely like that. Yes. Yeah, think, think back to if you think back to COVID. It, it, the president cannot just like shut down the country for these things. It, it was your state governors that had to do that because we live in a system of dual sovereignties where governors have different kinds of authority than the president does, and only police powers or general powers like that reside with governors. And so, you know, the president's pretty impotent in that situation to say, you know, we should shut down the country because we have this virus. And I, in many, I, I understand that there's lots of 
issues with the, the uh, questions about the pandemic. And I think Christians have had a lot of fruitful conversations about how to respond to that. But I think the some of the more under-discussed aspects of that were how much it exposed the limits of state power. And that individual, like the, the, yes, there were edicts that came down that locked down a lot of things, but there was a lot of backlash and pushback to that as well. And the, the ability of the state to administer long-term social transformation did not obtain in the way that I think some people were afraid that it might. Yes, I, yes. I did not think we would be in this place in 2024, which is basically back to normal. I didn't think that at all. I thought we would have a, a much more aggressive transformation. I thought it'd still be showing vaccine cards at the supermarket. Sure. And obviously that that's because people did take it seriously and responded to it, I think, effectively to, to preserve liberty. But I think what, what this should tell us is that there, there are multiple layers of power and sovereignty in any political context, just as there are in any social and cultural context. All of this is swimming in a kind of information environment where, you know, different ideas are flying back and forth. And this is going to limit the ability of any state environment, whether that's something that we like that is pro that advances Christian ideas or something that we don't like that is uh, antithetical to Christian ideas. All of this is weaker in an environment where technology leaves us cross pressured. We just don't we don't have a single king or monarch that can administer an edict and make something happen. And, you know, people didn't in the medieval times either. That was the idea right, of feudalism right, is right. that, you know, the king's pretty weak and just needs to get a bunch of lords on his side before he can afford to do anything. So the idea, the Hobbesian absolute state has never existed in, in the American context. It seems really unlikely to exist unless something really dramatic changes. Uh, and uh, I think that that needs to inform our cultural diagnoses because the what's making that so difficult is this kind of communications environment that we have. Yes, as one one guy in our church, who after after the pandemic, he every time I would talk to him, he would say, you know, all the people who were afraid of communism coming to the country, he said, look, if there was ever a better time for communism to come, I don't know of it. Because if they wanted to implement it, he said, and some I know did want to, they couldn't do it. And if they couldn't do it during COVID, they're not going to do it. Now, we, we may disagree with some of the, with, with some of the definitions there, but really, I mean, he, he, he makes the point you just made. It's not going to happen. And God has ordained that in the time in which we live, there is a little L liberal mentality. And we're never, I don't think we're ever really going to shake that because it's part of our, who we are. Mm -hmm. So we just do the best with what God has given us. Right. And I think that's, you know, I, I, I'm pretty close to a lot of political conversations. And I think that that's how, that's how I see being a Christian and somebody that works in these kinds of spaces is that this kind of global systemic change that is not the prerogative of any human being. If God wants to make that happen, God can make that happen in right. his time. Right. And maybe maybe, maybe that happens, maybe that doesn't. But in the meantime, I think it's incumbent upon us to live as faithfully as we can under the conditions we find ourselves in. And, you know, God, God's given us good gifts in at the lives and circumstances in which we find ourselves. My, If helping my kids is going to be more important than arguing with people online about political theory, um, I argue with people online about political theory a lot, but uh, at the end of the day, what matters more is that my kids are growing up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's right. Thank you, John. This has been a lot of fun, and I've learned some things, and a, a, a lot of things, actually. So thank you for taking time to meet today. It's been really good. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This has been this has been great, and just been a just been a pleasure to talk to you. I, I feel like I'm gonna I'm gonna think more about the the Protestantism spreading in Northern Europe. That was a that was a really interesting point, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do some further research on that. All right. Thanks. I appreciate it. The Good Life Podcast is a ministry of Trinity Reformed Church in Huntsville, Alabama. If you like this podcast, you might enjoy one of our other podcasts, Got a Minute, featuring Larson Hicks and Rich Luss. Theology, philosophy, economics, politics, and more for normal people.